For a donation of $50 or more by Labor Day, September 2nd, we'll send you an autographed copy of my latest book, We Praise You, O God. Make a secure online gift at thewordendoors.org or make your check payable to The Word Endures and send it to Box 616, Collinsville, Illinois, 62234. And we'll send you, We Praise You, O God. The Word of the Lord Endures Forever is brought to you in part by the Lutheran Heritage Foundation. LHF is a recognized service organization of the Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod, dedicated to translating and publishing the books of our Lutheran faith into more than 100 languages for our Christian brothers and sisters around the world. Learn how you can take part in their work at lhfmissions.org. If there was a one-stop shop resource for Advent and Lent, wouldn't you want to know? Well, there is. It's the Center for Biblical Studies from Concordia University, St. Paul, led by Dr. Reed Lessing. I'm Pastor Matthew Tuman, and I speak from experience, having used these preaching workshops. Offered online and recorded, they have it all. Sermons, slides, liturgical resources, and Bible studies. All for $25. Learn more at one.csp.edu forward slash Center for Biblical Studies. Welcome to The Word of the Lord Endures Forever with Pastor Will Whedon. You remember how Jesus prayed quite similar words in Luke 23, verse 46. Then Jesus called out with a loud voice, said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And having said this, he breathed his last. I've often wondered if then, during his hours on the cross, Jesus prayed his way from Psalm 22, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me, to Psalm 31. I wouldn't be the least bit surprised. The Word of the Lord Endures Forever is a daily verse-by-verse -verse Bible study with the church, past and present. Pastor Whedon is leading us in a study of the book of Psalms, chapters 1 through 41. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Greetings, people loved by God. Last time, we studied the beautiful and joyous Psalm 30, a psalm that David composed either for the dedication of the temple or of his own house, depends on whether you're reading the Masoretic text or the Septuagint. Given all the preparations David made for the temple, the idea that he would compose a piece to be sung at its dedication makes all the sense in the world. It begins with David extolling and thanking the Lord for his deliverance, the way he swooped in and rescued him from the plots of all his enemies. We saw that certainly applied to David and even more to David's son, Jesus. He cried for help and he was healed, healed with the resurrection of the dead, brought up from Sheol, restored to life from among those who go down to the pit. And that resurrection is the cause of the church's joyful song, her thanksgiving. God's righteous anger against human sin proved to be but for a moment as the Lamb of God was made sin for us upon the tree. But God's favor? It's forever, for a lifetime and more. Weeping had its place at the time of our Lord's passion and death. But now, now from the resurrection onward, we are in the time of joy and gladness. The morning light of eternal life burst from the tomb. David, and in him Jesus, spoke both of their confidence and also of their dismay at God hiding his face. But Jesus asks what profit there would be in his death if he abandoned us to the grave. No, he will turn our mourning into dancing, even as his father turned his. He will clothe us with glory that we may sing praise to him forever. The 31st Psalm, starting at the first verse. To the choir master, a psalm of David. In you, O Lord, do I take refuge. Let me never be put to shame. In your righteousness deliver me. Incline your ear to me. Rescue me speedily. Be a rock of refuge for me, a strong fortress to save me. For you are my rock and my fortress. For your name's sake, you lead me and guide me. You take me out of the net they have hidden for me, for you are my refuge. Into your hand I commit my spirit. You have redeemed me, O Lord, faithful God. 
I hate those who pay regard to worthless idols, but I trust in the Lord. I will rejoice and be glad in your steadfast love because you have seen my affliction. You have known the distress of my soul and you have not delivered me into the hand of the enemy. You have set my feet in a broad place. Be gracious to me, O Lord, for I am in distress. My eye is wasted from grief, my soul and my body also, for my life is spent with sorrow and my years with sighing. My strength fails because of my iniquity and my bones waste away. Because of all my adversaries, I've become a reproach, especially to my neighbors, and an object of dread to my acquaintances. Those who see me in the street flee from me. I have been forgotten like one who is dead. I have become like a broken vessel. Psalm 31, verses 1 through 12. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you for taking from us that heavy load of our sins which we could not bear, but which you bore in your body on the tree, ransoming us from eternal death. Give us patience and resignation in suffering with you, that we may willingly take up our cross daily, and follow you through suffering to glory. For you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Ready to work through these opening words of Psalm 31? Let's ponder them together. Verse 1, To the choir master, a psalm of David. In you, O Lord, do I take refuge. Let me never be put to shame. In your righteousness deliver me. Let me allow 16th century reformer Martin Luther to again introduce us to this psalm. He writes, The 31st psalm is a universal psalm of thanks, a psalm of prayer, and a psalm of comfort, all at the same time. It is spoken in the person of Christ and his saints, who on account of the word of God are plagued their entire life, inwardly with fears and troubles, outwardly with persecution, slander, and contempt. Yet they are comforted and delivered by God out of them all. So, David writes this psalm to be sung by the people of God when they're going through some rough times. The Septuagint superscription confirms this. For the end, a psalm of David, an utterance of extreme fear. In that extremity, David teaches us to call out to the Lord as our refuge, begging that he would not let us be put to shame, that is, be put to shame in our trust in him that in his righteousness he would grant us deliverance. St. Augustine writes of God's righteousness in the 5th century, There is a justice that belongs to God but becomes ours as well when it is given to us. It's called God's justice to ensure that humans do not imagine that they have any justice as coming from themselves. Once again, we see that David bases his plea upon God's gift and not upon any achievement of his own. He goes on, verse 2, Incline your ear to me, rescue me speedily. Be a rock of refuge for me, a strong fortress to save me. He asks God to bend down and listen to his plea and grant him a speedy rescue. He asks him to be his rock of protection and his fortress where he can find safety. And it is striking that after asking God to be this for him, he immediately confesses that he is indeed such. And he makes a further request. Verse 3, For you are my rock and my fortress, and for your name's sake you lead me and guide me. Verse 4, You take me out of the net they have hidden for me, for you are my refuge. He confesses that God is his rock and refuge, and on that basis asks God to lead him and guide him and release him from the snares that his enemies have set to capture and destroy him. So David... And so the great son of David prayed in his passion. So the people of God pray, especially against the demonic snares that would entrap them in rebellion against their benevolent master. Verse 5, Into your hand I commit my spirit. You have redeemed me, O Lord, faithful God. You remember how Jesus prayed quite similar words in Luke 23, verse 46. Then Jesus called out with a loud voice, said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And having said this, he breathed his last. I've often wondered if then, during his hours on the cross, Jesus prayed his way from Psalm 22, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me, to Psalm 31. I wouldn't be the least bit surprised. 
But these words are also familiar to any who know the church's Order of Compline, her prayer at the close of the day composed by St. Benedict of Nursia. After the reading or readings, the responsory is sung, and these words compose its key thought. Into your hands, O Lord, I commend my spirit. You have redeemed me, O Lord, God of truth. I commend my spirit. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit. Into your hands, O Lord, I commend my spirit. This is all part of the church's daily practice. For the last time, we lay down in this world and close our eyes. They are all death rehearsals. And so it is in this psalm. We commit our spirits into the hands of the very one who loved us enough to redeem us. And that enables us to pray that awake we may watch with Christ and to sleep we may rest in peace. Verse 6, I hate those who pay regard to worthless idols, but I trust in the Lord. Hate here is used similarly to when the Lord Jesus commands us to hate our father and mother. See Luke 14, verse 26 and following. He means he refuses to accommodate those who repose their trust in pointless idols, and instead he chooses, like with Joshua, to have the true and living God as the one who will be his trust. Verse 7, I will rejoice and be glad in your steadfast love because you have seen my affliction. You have known the distress of my soul, verse 8, and you have not delivered me into the hand of the enemy. You have set my feet in a broad place. This is quite similar to a verse we'll consider later from Psalm 56. You have kept count of my tossings. Put all my tears in your bottle. Are they not in your book? David, and through Christ, all Christians, can rejoice that God's steadfast love is theirs. God sees and knows their afflictions and distress, and he has not abandoned them to the hand of their enemies. Verse 9. Be gracious to me, O Lord, for I am in distress. My eye is wasted from grief, my soul and my body also. We always like to imagine that what affects the soul is one thing and what affects the body is another. But we really are composite beings. And suffering of the soul of our interior life inevitably has an effect on the outer life, the body. And certainly when bodily ailments pile up, it can have an effect upon the soul, weighing it down in heaviness and sadness. So instead of compartmentalizing, we need to see that God is out to rescue our whole person, not just pieces of us. The Lutheran Large Catechism thus speaks in this way about the effects of the Holy Eucharist. Listen. We must never think of the sacrament as something harmful from which we had better flee, but as a pure, wholesome, comforting remedy that grants salvation and comfort. It will cure you and give you life both in body and soul. For where the soul has recovered, the body also is relieved. Verse 10. For my life is spent with sorrow and my years with sighing. My strength fails because of my iniquity and my bones waste away. So again, note the inner unity. Inner sorrows lead to sighing. Bodily strength declines because of iniquity, with the result that one feels like he or she is just wasting away. And it is entirely correct to hear these words in the mouth of our Savior as his strength failed when he, the sinless and the holy one, was made to carry all of our sin upon Golgotha's stony slopes. Verse 11. Because of all my adversaries, I have become a reproach, especially to my neighbors, and an object of dread to my acquaintances. Those who see me in the street flee from me. Verse 12. I have been forgotten like one who is dead. I have become like a broken vessel. A reproach, of course, means an object of mockery and scorn, and that is exactly what the Lord Jesus had become to his own people at the time of his passion. And so here he laments his social isolation, how he has not only been abandoned by his father, but by his own people who had previously flocked to hear him and to see his many signs. In a similar way, people who have bowed the knee to King Jesus will also experience reproach and disdain in this world because of him but they will regard that disdain as a badge of honor. And that's where we're going to have to stop for today. Next time, we'll finish up the words of Psalm 31 
as we hear of Christ's unfailing trust in his Father despite his sufferings and his prayer of thanksgiving to the one who wondrously showed his steadfast love by raising him from the dead. Till next time, people loved by God, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. Thanks for listening to The Word of the Lord Endures Forever with Pastor Will Whedon. The Word of the Lord Endures Forever is a listener-supported program. You can donate by check. Make your check payable to The Word Endures and send it to Box 616, Collinsville, Illinois, 62234. You can also make a secure online contribution at thewordendures.org. The Word of the Lord Endures Forever is a production of LPR, Lutheran Public Radio.